All right, so firstly, uh, thank you for uh, each and every one of you for joining us uh, in celebrating our third year here in Singapore. Your support and partnership is one of the reasons why we're able to celebrate the occasion today. Before I get into the main gist of my presentation, allow me to take you through some of the key milestones along the way. So it's been just over a year since we moved into this retail space here. And along the way, we've also introduced our very own Bullion Star Gold Bar, where you can trade uh, physical gold without any spread. This bar is minted and essayed by Argo Horaeus, which is one of the four uh, large Swiss refineries. These bars also qualify as Singapore investment grade precious metals and hence are tax free. In addition, we've been bringing in a wider range of bullion products and numismatic products, and you can see our display, display cases over here filling up quite nicely. We've also released our charts feature, like uh, what Torgny mentioned, and this will allow you to use uh, gold and silver as a ruler to me measure other assets. Recently, we've also uh, launched our stored value facility. This is kind of like a fancy name for saying that you can keep funds with us on your account. Um, this helps you save the cost of paying repeated bank fees, so you can transfer a large sum, especially if you're living overseas, and then use that sum of money to purchase in smaller amounts of gold and silver if you wish. This will naturally speed up the transaction flow here at Bullion Star, and you'll be able to see all your bullion holdings as well as your cash holdings all in one place on your account. Now, as we take a step back and uh, take a look at the global gold market, um, you know, Tony touched on the Chinese gold market earlier, and I thought that this cartoon would fit right in. So here you see the folks on the Chinese side throwing US dollars across the fence in exchange for gold being thrown back. Now let's put modern day economics aside and just looking plainly at the cartoon. Doesn't something inside you just tell you that something's not right with this picture? Who do you think is getting the better deal? <laughs> of course, this is putting it simply, but I think the principle of it still holds true. <laughs> So as we touch on uh, gold prices later on, firstly, I think, it's, uh, I think there's been a lot of misunderstanding in the gold markets. So for clarity's sake, I think it will be helpful to present a more structured and deeper view of the factors and considerations that affect gold and silver prices. So this is kind of the framework that I use to think about gold and silver prices, and here's what I'll be covering today. So first, I'll be walking through some of the fundamental reasons for owning physical gold and silver, and then I'll touch about what the current market sentiment is like for gold. I'll point out the main reasons for uh, weakness that we're seeing in gold and silver. And lastly, I'll provide some insights into the physical market. So let's jump right in. Fundamentals. So oftentimes, I think people forget the main reason for owning physical gold and silver. You see, if you buy paper gold and silver as a trader, then not much has changed. In fact, you might be liking the volatility in the markets. With the introductions of gold ETFs in 2004 and su sub subsequently paper gold CFDs, we're seeing a lot of new retail participants enter the market over the past years, looking to take advantage of the price swings and making money off them. I mean, as a retail trader, and one that is looking for a quick way to make money, the odds are really stacked against you in this market. Firstly, there's a huge information asymmetry where professionals have much wider information access than you do as a retail investor. And secondly, institutions can actually purchase deep book data that, where they can know all the different order levels so that they can flush out weak hands. But now, if you, here's the difference. If, if you've bought physical gold as a saver and, or as protection or insurance, then the reasons for doing so are stronger now than ever before. Like what Torgny mentioned earlier, the fundamental reasons for owning physical gold and silver is to protect yourself against the risk of the crash of the debt system that has been built up over years and years, or to protect yourself in the event that paper currencies lose their purchasing power, or thirdly, if and when the paper and gold silver markets default and can, cannot pay you any trading profits, let alone give back the initial capital that you deposited with them. So whether we get you know, debt defaults across the world or paper currencies losing their money, uh, losing their purchasing power, or whether gold and silver market, paper market defaults, you own the physical stuff for all of these reasons. So as a saver, I would say that the fundamental reasons for owning physical gold and silver are still there. In fact, they are stronger now than ever before in our current economic environment. 
from an investment perspective, if you focus on price, you might be thinking that you know, gold is losing money. But if you relook at it and you think about the primary reasons, you know, the main reasons for owning gold, then the fundamental reasons are stronger than ever. I mean, who, who knows how long more this credit or debt bubble can continue? Who knows the day when the masses of people lose faith in um, paper money? I don't know when these things might happen, but I'd rather be insured and protected early against these outcomes than be too late. From a market sentiment basis, there has been a lot of negative sentiment on gold over the past year or so. We see uh, news on how gold, along with the rest of the commodities, are on a downtrend and might go even lower. We read analysis pieces on how gold has lost its quality as a safe haven asset, or even how it's lost its luster. On the co-mix market, which at present still remains the most popular derivative market for buying and selling paper gold and silver futures, the speculative short positions are close to their all-time highs, where speculators are selling gold that they don't own in the first place, betting that the price of gold will go even lower. But you see, the thing to note is that in all of these sentiments, they are focused on paper, paper price of gold and not physical gold. The way I see it, it's about calculating the amount that you own correctly and being able to hold on to your gold and silver for the long term to protect yourself against this risk that I mentioned earlier. And not getting taken out when, you've, when you have like a sudden need for funds and you lack the liquidity for it. So what are some of the main uh, reasons for weaknesses that we are seeing in the spot prices of gold and silver? Firstly, I think the main reason for, for, for this is actually the strength of the US dollar. Because gold and silver is usually priced in US dollars, with the strength of the US dollar growing, it has a negative effect on the spot price of gold and silver. The current strength of the US dollar might seem counterintuitive with the sheer amount of money printing that is going on in the States, but it's because of its reserve status, like what Torkney pointed out earlier, that there seems to be enough demand to prop up the value of the US dollar and not cause it to devalue. Here's what I mean. Firstly, more than 80% of global trade finance is denominated in US dollars, according to Bank of International Settlements. This means that when importers or exporters or banks or financiers, insurers, when they issue credit or debt, 80% of it is denominated in US dollars. Secondly, commodities such as gold and oil are usually priced in US dollars, which means the US dollar makes up the carry trade when people or institutions around the world want to invest in these commodities in financial markets. Let's say a large commodities company in China holding Chinese renminbi wishes to hedge their risk by going on a forward or a futures market. Unless they have OTC arrangements or are going through some of the newer exchanges, their home currency would first be converted into US dollars and then used to purchase a forward contract or a futures contract. Similarly, us as retail investors, when we look to participate in the US uh, stock market or the bond market, our home currency would first be converted into US dollars before purchasing that share or that bond. Thirdly, according to a report published by IMF earlier this year, the dollar makes up more than 60% of central bank foreign reserves. Now that's a lot of demand for US dollars. So all these factors contribute to the US dollar status as the reserve currency of the world and continues to prop up the value of the US dollar despite the amount of money printing going on. Let's take a look at the effect of the strong US dollar on gold. Okay, so here I've, uh, I've charted spot gold price in US dollars on top of the dollar index. Now the dollar index is an instrument that tracks the value of the US dollar relative to a basket of weighted foreign currencies, which consists of the euro, which makes up the heaviest weight, the yen, the pound, the Canadian dollar, the Swedish krona, and the Swiss franc. So essentially, the dollar index rises when um, the US dollar gains strength compared to the, the, the basket of currencies. As gold is priced in US dollars, there's an inverse relationship with the strength of the US dollar. That means if the price of the US dollar goes up, the price of gold goes down. But let's say I want to get a clearer picture of the correlation in gold so that I can see an indication of how much gold's weakness is correlated to the strength of the US dollar, I would simply flip the US dollar index around and use the inverse index to find its correlation. So that's what I've done here. So here you see this is actually the dollar weakening. So black is the inverse uh, dollar index and gold is gold. <laughs> so from 2001 to 2009, we actually see the dollar 
value decreasing because it's the inverse. And similarly, in, in correlation, you can see gold's price increasing. So gold reached its all-time high in 2011 when gold hit 1,900 US dollars per ounce. And then we've seen a period of consolidation. And here you really see um, that when the US dollar weakens, gold follows. But I'd say from looking at this, the US dollar has gained a whole lot of strength, but actually if you look at it, gold has held its ground comparatively. Now another question that I usually ask is, if we're living here in Singapore, or just across the border in Malaysia, why should we put so much attention on gold price in US dollars? If the money that we earn and that we pay our bills in are in our home currency, shouldn't we view gold in our home currency to get a be better measure? So let's take a look at gold price in Sing dollars and in some of the currencies of our neighboring countries. So this, uh, first here we have gold price in Sing dollars. The Sing dollar has been relatively strong compared to its neighboring peers in the region. So price-wise, it's actually hovering relatively close to where it was last year around the same time. But now if we cross the border, it paints a very different picture. So here we see gold price in the ringgit. And because of the depreciation of the ringgit, gold is actually close to its one-year highs. Similarly, when we look at Indonesia, we see gold hovering close to its one-year highs. In fact, gold in the rupiah is actually closer to its all-time highs due to the currency depreciating and losing purchasing power. So you see, gold tends to hold its value in the midst of currencies losing purchasing power. You know, some of you may have heard of the term currency wars, coined by Jim Ricketts. It's a term used to describe our current economic environment, whereby countries are competing with each other by devaluing their currency, and Singapore is no different. Why is this, you may ask? You see, Singapore and these neighboring countries rely on trade surpluses, or it's the amount by which their net exports exceed their net imports to contribute to the strength of the economy. As opposed to the West, they have a bit more developed economy and have the power to run trade deficits, as Tokeni touched on earlier. So let's look at some charts. So this is Singapore's balance of trade. It, after the, uh, the Asian crisis in 1998, uh, we see that Singapore has, record, has been recording positive trade surpluses all throughout till present. Our current trade surplus stands at 6.7 billion uh, Sing dollars as of July 2015. Here in Malaysia, similarly after the 1998 crisis, Malaysia has also been pulling in uh, a positive trade surplus. As of July 2015, it stands at 2.3 billion ringgit. Indonesia, similarly, but they haven't fared too well recently. But as of July, their trade surplus stands at 1.3 billion US dollars. And of course, the big one, China. 60 billion US dollars as of July 2015. Now, when we compare this to a more developed country, like let's say the United States, what do we see? Very developed. $42 billion in trade deficit. Now you might be asking, Luke, why did you bring this up? Did you just show me that the currencies of uh, Malaysia and Indonesia were depreciating, and of course, most recently, China as well? It's precisely because in this region, exports are so important to the economy that these countries have to compete on price. And what's the easiest way to compete of, on price uh, as a nation on a whole? It's to devalue your currency that, so that your products become cheaper and more competitive compared to its neighboring countries. So with this in mind, I think the probabilities lie in favor of the currencies devaluing further, especially now, with the biggest export nation in the world, China, devaluing their currency as well. So my advice would be to stock up on physical gold and silver if you haven't already, as this trend is not likely to end anytime soon, as currency wars tend to go on for a long time. So let's talk a bit about the difference between paper gold and physical gold. Well, obviously physical gold is a finite supply of gold for sale, whereas in the paper gold markets, there's no constraint on the amount of gold for sale. A speculator can simply short the market, betting that the price of gold will go down and close his position for a profit if indeed it goes down. In the physical market, there's no leverage, which means if an ounce of gold is worth 1,600 Sing dollars, you would have to pay 1,600 Sing dollars to buy it. But let's say if it was leveraged 10 times in the paper markets, you only have to fork out uh, 160 bucks to gain exposure. And like you will see later on in my presentation, this leverage ratio is getting rather risky now. 
But let's, let's take a look at how these paper markets are run. So I think most of you might have heard of COMEX. So COMEX is the most popular derivative market for uh, paper gold and silver. So it's a futures market, which means that participants can buy or sell contracts and allow them to request for delivery at a later date, uh, at a specified future date. Now, because a lot of these participants do not actually request for delivery, but rather keep their profits in currency value, it actually allows COMEX to hold less amount of gold compared to the number of contracts being exchanged. So with this in mind, let's take a look at how much um, the gold, gold has, uh, the COMEX has in, in, in stock. So here I have a chart that goes from 2013 to 2015. I got this chart from uh, Gold Charts R Us. It's not my own work, so I have to give credit where it's due. So first we have the price of gold up top, and next we have the open interest level. So the open interest is actually the number of contracts or the number of open positions on the, the exchange. Now each contract is 100 ounces, so if we multiply 100 ounces by the number of open interest, essentially we get the notional value of gold being traded over the exchange in uh, May 2015 which was 41 million ounces. Now, COMEX keeps its re registered gold stocks with different banks, for example, with HSBC, JP Morgan, Bank of Scotia. Uh, so in May 2015, the amount of registered gold stocks was only 373,000. So that means that for every ounce of paper gold, uh, for every ounce of real gold, there was about 110 gold claims or gold owners entitled to that gold. So one out of every 100 ounces of gold, it, so if one out of every 100 ounces of gold on COMEX is claimed, COMEX will actually run out of gold to deliver. Now I've got the latest statistic as of the 4th of September 2015. Uh, can anyone have a guess what that leverage ratio is like now? Maybe Lars. Yeah, no, I think it's 205. Very good, you've been reading Zero Hedge. <laughs> Really? Well, I mean, as of 2004, uh, I mean, 4th of September, it was 207. Wow, wow, wow. So this, this screen doesn't even have enough space to fit all my nice icons. Yeah, yeah, one by one, actually. No, <laughs> I grouped them in tens and then I went for it. <laughs> so I think that the probability of COMEX not being able to deliver and thus defaulting is actually much higher than the probability of them being able to honor their commitments to deliver, especially in view of the physical shortages that we're seeing on the ground right now. So what we're seeing on the ground is, like what Tony mentioned, shortages across the world on a huge scale. As some of you would know, the US Mint has stopped producing Silver Eagles, and the Royal Canadian Mint has a huge backlog of orders to deliver for. One of the largest wholesale suppliers in the world has stopped taking new orders for maples and philharmonics altogether. Here at Bullion Style, we are very aggressive in terms of keeping uh, high levels of inventory compared to our competitors. But for many of our products, you know, once we s sell out, I, it, it'll be hard for us to replenish them. So what now? What happens when there is such high physical demand, but the price of paper, gold, and silver still remain low? One possible scenario is a decoupling of physical gold and silver from the prices of spot gold and silver. We've got a small glimpse of this back in October 2008 when spot silver was trading for about nine bucks, nine US dollars an ounce. An American silver eagle was selling for $17. Now that's an 88% premium above spot. Now this premium can shoot up much higher if there's a big, if there's a big enough squeeze. So in view of this, you gotta get physical. Personally, close to 50% of my liquid assets are held in precious metals. Some of you in this room might be more heavily invested than I am, some of you less, but the important point is to set aside an amount that you can let go of and put it in precious metals for the long term. It's my view that now is a good time to stock up on precious metals if you haven't already. And like I mentioned earlier, I'd rather be insured and feel safe and protected early than be too late. So let's look ahead and to see what you can expect from us here at Bullion Star. So here's what we're working on at the moment. We are creating a dedicated mobile site that will be super user friendly with full capabilities to be able to place orders on the go, to give you price updates, to view your portfolio, to read blog posts, and even have new features such as the possibility to set alerts on your phone. So like, let's say if the price of gold drops to, I don't know, 1,000, you'll get like an alert on your phone to trigger that. We're also revamping our desktop website, 
which will include new features such as bullion deposits or transfers. Have any of you felt that it's actually really hard to find information on the different gold and silver markets around the world? Like, you know, hard to find information about Shanghai Gold Exchange, what happens on the Dubai Exchange? What, what, what are some of the vaults like that hold these uh, gold and silver bars? Who are the more reputable precious metals refineries? What are some of the central bank gold policies? So Bullion Star, we are actually developing an exhaustive wiki-like portal, and we're working with the best in the industry to become the global online authority on precious metals. So there, th that's a lot to look forward to, and I hope you've enjoyed my presentation. Uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs>